Thank you, Kieran. I love hearing that story. I think it's fantastic. <laughs> um, so uh, our next speaker, uh, Lydia Yi. Uh, Lydia Yi is curator at the Barbican Art Gallery in London. Uh, previously, she was senior curator at the Bronx Museum uh, of Arts in New York City. Um, she'll be discussing uh, a few exhibitions that she's, she's organized at the Barbican. And uh, I'll invite her up right now. Welcome, Lydia. Thank you, Pauline, and thank you, Lars, and I've been delighted to be here the last few days um, with colleagues um, at other institutions and M+. Plus. Um, it's been a terrific series of conversations that I hope we can find ways of continuing in the future. Um, I'm a curator at the Barbican, as Pauline mentioned, which is a very different kind of institution than either M+, Plus or the V&A. Um, we're a non-collecting institution, so that has a bearing upon uh, what we display because we don't have a collection, and how we also interpret and um, what kind of strategies we have for um, presenting the objects from um, temporary shows to the public. So I'm going to talk about a couple of these shows um, this evening. Um, the first, um, I'd like to just tell you a little bit about the Barbican. Um, the Barbican um, Center is um, a, a big art center, probably not unlike um, what the Hong Kong um, or the West Kowloon um, Cultural Authority project will be like. We have concert hall, a couple of theaters, three cinemas, and two galleries, but we're also part of a really big housing estate. Um, there's more than um, 2,000 apartments also on the um, footprint of the Barbican, which spans 35 acres. And um, it was built during, um, from the late 60s until the early 80s in a, in a brutalist concrete style. You can see examples of two of the tower blocks and one of the terraced buildings, very much influenced by Le Corbusier. Um, characteristics include the brutalist concrete slabs raised on Pilati. Um, the pedestrians um, don't have to deal with any cars. Um, the cars run under a tunnel underneath the center. Um, so it's a very kind of, in many ways, idyllic um, situation. We have um, also uh, gardens and, and a, a, a kind of man-made lake. Um, um, the architects, uh, Chamberlain, Bonn, and Powell, who designed the Barbican Center um, and the estate, brought in a lot of the same motifs into the gallery. So that makes for maybe a less than ideal gallery situation. We have heavy concrete pillars, hand chiseled, um, that um, three of them divide the space. Um, there's big walkways and um, a very massive staircase. Um, so there's a central void surrounded by smaller galleries on each side. Um, um, so really, the galleries um, don't adhere to the notion of the white cube. Um, the, there is um, natural daylight. Um, we have the option of opening up skylights. Um, most gallery spaces for modern and contemporary art, they try to seal the space from any outside um, influence and, um, and, and the possibility of having the outside environment affect the conditions in the gallery. But this isn't really the case with um, the Barbican space. Um, in some ways, it looks like a kind of um, a futuristic version from the 1950s and 60s. Um, when I first got there, um, one of the things I thought about this um, space is it looked sort of like a, spa a spaceship from 2001, a space odyssey. Um, and this vision of the Barbican as a some sort of um, massive concrete um, space traveling vehicle influenced one of the first exhibitions I worked on, um, the Martian Museum of Terrestrial Art. Um, this exhibition I co-curated with Francesco Manacorda. Both of us were new to the Barbican. Um, and we uh, took as a starting point um, the first, um, a chapter of um, Terry Dedouve's book, Conte After Duchamp, in which he imagines an uh, imaginary anthropologist um, um, coming to Earth and setting out to inventory all that humans call art. So um, the Ma Martian anthropologist is role is to survey what humans produce under the category called art. Um, this fictional perspective allowed us to do a couple of different things. It um, gave us the opportunity to look at contemporary art from a fresh perspective, and it also gave us um, uh, the ability to reassess from an alien standpoint as if we weren't 
um, on the inside in many ways. Um, and this was a strategy to mimic how um, Western anthropologists have traditionally interpreted non-Western cultures through foreign eyes. So this is the entrance to the exhibition, um, including a font that um, most viewers couldn't read. Um, that's the kind of intro text panel. The rest of it was in um, um, English. Um, so uh, this, the exhibition was organized into um, pseudo-anthropological categories, um, things like magic and belief or ritual or kinship and descent. Um, and it allowed us to um, raise critical conditions about categorization and how we displayed works of art. Um, we made up our own taxonomy using this system, and we also interpreted or sometimes misinterpreted um, contemporary art objects. So a couple of examples, um, Maurizio Catalan's untitled Picasso Lichtenstein was put into the category alongside with Sherry Levine's Fountain of Ancestor Worship. Um, um, this could possibly uh, be an accurate reading, some people might think, and other people would be very confused by this. <laughs> Um, another section um, focused on rituals and a subsection of that was on traps. So we looked at a work by Damien Hirst, um, some work by Andrea Slominski and a Mona Hatoum piece and called them all traps of some sort um, that might have a ritual function. Um, so um, we also worked, um, because we don't have kind of a traditional space, we're very much in some ways freed up to work with different designers Ar sometimes architects, graphic designers, to help design our exhibitions. In this case, we worked with the architect Jamie Fobert on the exhibition design. He um, came up with the idea of creating these linkages through these copper strips on the floor. And we also worked with the graphic designer, Sarah DeBond, who came up with the graphics for the exhibition. We also produced an audio guide um, with a very kind of um, authorial British voice who gave um, definitive um, kind of interpretations of the work. This was to help reinforce these kind of dubious interpretations and make them seem as if there was some authority behind them. Um, ultimately, the exhibition allowed us to understand artworks that that, um, do not always have stable meanings. They are shaped by context, framing, and display, and most especially by the perspective of the viewer, which leads me to our next exhibition, um, in very different contexts, very different type of exhibition, but some of the thinking of the Martian Museum informed this one as well. Um, in, in the year um, 1919, um, Walter Gropius founded the Bauhaus by merging two existing schools, the Academy of Art in Weimar and the, uh, the School of Arts and Crafts also in Weimar. And here's the building originally of um, the Academy of Art. You, um, and not only did he inherit a building, but he also inherited a faculty and a lot of other baggage um, by um, starting the school, even though it had been on hiatus during the years of the war um, in which Gropius served as an army officer. Um, his goal was to reestablish the school and provide guidance to industry trade in the crafts, and this was a, quite a new concept at the time where crafts and arts training were very different. Um, so the 90th anniversary of the Bauhaus was marked by two major exhibitions. One, Bauhaus, a conceptual model you see here, happened in Berlin at the Martin Gropius Bau and included more than 900 objects was organized by the three main Bauhaus archives in Weimar, Dessau, and Berlin. And I think they all wanted, this was the first chance they had to work together, and they all wanted to show off some of the strengths of their collections. And in some ways, perhaps with 900 objects, you kind of think, could they have edited the show differently? Um, MoMA, on the other hand, um, had about half the number of objects. They also did a 90th anniversary exhibition called Bauhaus Workshops for Modernity in 2009. They very much hewed to the traditional um, MoMA departmental structure, separating things like um, furniture from paintings, from photographs, from prints and drawings, from architectural um, drawings and models. Um, so um, while MoMA um, also wanted to talk about the Bauhaus as a school, and I think they started off um, fairly successfully doing that, they often returned to some of the same tropes about artists individual artists and individual mediums. Um, by contrast, Bauhaus Artist Life, which was in a, on a similar scale as um, MoMA, um, 
the, the MoMA exhibition with more than 400 objects, um, we don't have a collection. So we had to rely on a collaboration, a very good collaboration with the three main Bauhaus archives in Germany. We borrowed more than 300 objects from them and um, included a mixture of both art objects, documentation, ephemera, and a number of other kinds of objects, um, design, um, th and also things that had a kind of um, indeterminate status in between or mo occupying multiple categories. Um, we also used a lot of things like large-scale blow-up photographs to give you a sense of how um, these, um, in this um, case, pieces of furniture were used by um, the Bauhaus faculty and students um, in, in everyday settings. Um, here's the um, opening, the entrance to the MoMA exhibition. As I mentioned, they did want to emphasize that the, 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 the Bauhaus was a school. Um, they featured students um, as the opening image, but once in the galleries, the students somehow disappeared um, with classical pieces by um, paintings by Schlemmer Clay, um, works by Albers and others. Um, the Barbican exhibition also included a number of the same loans, um, but we tried to treat the material in different ways. Um, um, we had very early examples of ceramics, for example, by um, Theodore Bogler, as well as classical artworks um, by um, figures such as um, Vasily Kandinsky. Um, one of our challenges is, wasn't the history of the Bauhaus, um, um, which heavily weighed on both the German exhibition and the MoMA exhibition, um, but one of the things that we found that British audiences um, often resorted to understanding the Bauhaus as a style, um, and we were interested in to discover that this was not something that was new. Um, in 1929, um, 10 years after the Bauhaus was founded, um, the editor of the school's magazine already identified some of the hallmarks of Bauhaus style. Um, here, you can see here things like houses with glass and metal, or um, painting, no painting on the wall, white walls, or sometimes incomprehensible paintings on the wall. So all of these things were identified as Bauhaus style. Um, so we wanted to kind of, in some ways, um, uh, refute this sort of style. Um, we re-emphasized the students. Um, the entrance to the exhibition included this graphic um, that was from the student brochure. It says, young people come to the Bauhaus. Um, the designers, Carmody Groke, the architects for the exhibition, used a lot of large-scale graphics and color in the exhibition. A lot of people associate the Bauhaus with being all white. Um, that um, in some ways was a myth. Um, the, some of the early designs for the school incorporated color into the buildings, um, as you see in this Hinnick Schepper um, study for the um, exterior of the Bauhaus Dessau buildings. Um, but really, um, we tried to mix media as much as possible. Um, um, and this was in part a necessity. We didn't have all the classic paintings and some of the great furniture. We had to make do with some of that, but we also had to use documents and photographs and ephemera to flesh out the story. Um, so for example, in a section called Instruments of Communication, um, we did have Herbert Byers' um, cigarette pavilion, a design for a trade fair, but also um, it was interesting to realize that he had designed emergency currency. Germany was in the midst of a period of hyperinflation and new um, notes had to be printed up on a regular basis and one of the Bauhaus students, Bayer, um, designed the currency in very short order for this um, purpose. Um, the Bauhaus also had financial problems. They were always having to market themselves, sell their products. So um, we included an example of a price quote for um, um, the sale of furniture and textiles. Um, a section called Young People Come to the Bauhaus really was at the heart of the exhibition, included photographs and other graphics, as well as film and architectural models um, documenting the building. But it also looked at how people use the building, in particular the students. Um, we had photographs of many of the classes, as this one, Joseph Albers' preliminary course. We had things like Gunther Stotzel's um, student ID card. And she was the first female, or the only female, who became a junior master, a teacher at the school. She crossed off on her student card the word student and replaced it with the word master in the masculine form. And we also had um, documents like the student magazine. Um, we had another section called Our Party, Our Play, Our Work. This was an art school after all. These are all things that contemporary art students do today. 
Um, and we wanted to make people understand that the Bauhaus was a place that was very lively and had a lot of the same activities that you see in art school now. So they had parties, um, there was a, in, a school band, and they also made great um, invitation cards and posters for their, um, some of their events. Um, some of the objects um, um, could be understood as artworks, they could be also understood as gifts, they could be understood as maybe something more ephemeral. Here are three examples from that section. Um, Paul Clay's Gifts for Jay was loaned to us by the Museum of Modern Art. They didn't even include it in their exhibition, but this painting commemorates an event where Paul Clay was turning 50 and his students decided to deliver his gifts. Um, they hired a Junkers aircraft, Dessau was building these planes, and they dropped the gifts from the sky because he was such a kind of otherworldly personality. They wanted him to receive the gifts um, from the air, not somebody knocking on his door. Um, another example of a sort of a kind of a personal memento is Gunther Stolzl's, she made diplomas, individual diplomas for each of her students. And, um, okay, a couple more minutes. <laughs> um, um, Herbert Beyer, um, as a departing gift for Gropius, the founding director, um, gathered uh, the signatures and um, lip prints of uh, 44 Bauhauslers and made this um, farewell card for Gropius. Um, in the um, second from last section of the exhibition, we looked at photography and the uses of photography. Um, so, um, and, and often these objects, we weren't certain what the original purpose was. So was Moholy Naj's photograph that you see on the left, was this an experiment? Was he creating it for some graphic purpose? He was the school's principal designer. Um, you know, it, the, many of the objects appeared as images in other um, promotional materials or similar things. So was he influenced by the graphic work of the bears in their Bauhaus perspective or was it the other way around? These were interesting debates and dynamics at the school. Um, the exhibition close ended with a very kind of, in a simple manner, there was a small case that only contained two objects. Um, one of them was the resignation letter that Mies van der Rohe, well not really a re resignation letter, but a letter announcing the closure of the school. He tried to explain um, to the faculty, students, and perhaps to the public why the school was closing. Um, he said it wasn't really due to the um, secret police's investigation of the school. The, um, the Bauhaus was prepared to meet all their requirements, which included things like um, that no Jewish faculty or um, all the faculty had to sign statements professing their um, support of the National Socialists. Um, so he was really put it down to economic reasons, which was a slightly chilling letter to read. Um, in the same case, we put Iwo Yamawaki's um, attack on the Bauhaus, which presented a very different picture of the Bauhaus. Um, while on the one hand, um, uh, Mies was saying that we, are, we closed for money reasons, um, Yamawaki was um, saying that you know the National Socialists have raided our school and um, have put you know the um, school and faculty under a enormous pressure. So we left a lot of these things up for the public to decide about you know which direction or which um, document to read in which way or how to understand a particular object in the show. Thank you.